The issue of software patents is one that is plagued by many myths. So I want to start, I want to structure this speech around correcting some of these myths. And the first myth that I want to deal with is the myth that copyright law and patent law are similar, that copyrights and patents do basically the same thing, they're minor variations on a theme. Nothing could be further from the truth. At, in every point, what copyright law restricts you and, and how patent law restricts you are different. These two laws have essentially nothing in common as far as the restrictions they impose on the public are concerned. And therefore, to try to consider these two laws together as if they were one subject is a terrible mistake. It leads to failing to understand either one of them. But people are encouraged to do just that when they hear the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, a term which tries to generalize about copyright law and patent law and other laws, which are all equally different, totally different. So to generalize about any two of them would be a mistake. And generalizing about all of them is an even worse mistake. As soon as a person tries to think about or study, quote, the issue of intellectual property rights, unquote, he's already so confused that we can't expect him to come to a sensible conclusion. All of the natural, simply stated opinions about this simplistic overgeneralization are simplistic overgeneralizations. And therefore, almost any opinion about, quote, intellectual property, unquote, is a foolish one. I do not have an opinion about, quote, intellectual property, unquote. I have opinions about copyright law. I have different opinions about patent law. I have different opinions about trademark law. I think about these three different subjects separately, and I hope that you will too. The next myth you will encounter about software patents, when, when the issue of software patents comes up, is a myth about what patents do. So I better tell you a few basic things about patent law. A patent is a government-issued monopoly on using a certain technique or making a certain kind of thing. But here's how it's stated. The patent is published by a patent office, and in the patent it says, here's the list of claims. Claim one, a machine that has these five parts. Claim two, a machine that has these seven parts. Claim three, a machine that has these 15 parts doing certain specified things. Well, then, any machine which has you know, if it has a million parts, but five of them correspond to what's listed in claim one, that whole machine's prohibited. Anywhere in those million parts of this machine, if there are five things that correspond to what's listed in claim number one, that machine's prohibited by the patent. <clears throat> These patents last for 20 years starting from when someone applied for the patent. You see, the patent office issues patents in response to an application. Someone pays an expensive application fee and even more money to the lawyers who draw up the patent so that it will give him a lot of power. And if, if the lawyers have done this right, the patent office sometime later issues the patent. And the patent is an absolute monopoly on using a certain technical idea. <clears throat> so the myth that people have is the idea that what's being patented is an entire product. They think that if someone designs a product, he will go and, quote, patent the product, unquote. 
That's already a mistake. And they will imagine that if his product was new, that nobody else could possibly have patented it before. So he's the only one that can patent it. And he alone will have a patent on this product. This is completely a myth because patents don't cover an entire product. Each patent is a monopoly on using a certain method, technical method. And that method is probably just a tiny part of a real product today in a field like software. So today, the situation we really face is that in one software product, there are thousands of different ideas, and each of them might be patented by somebody else. So this myth of one patent per product gives people completely the wrong idea of the system they're trying to think about. And this myth is used very effectively by the lobbyists in favor of software patents. Another myth that they appeal to is the myth that software patents, quote, protect, unquote, the, quote, small inventor, unquote. The lobbyists in favor of software patents are working for mega corporations. So when they say that this is good for small companies, one must suspect that they're trying to pull the wool over our legislators' eyes. In fact, the situation is that software patents are mainly good for the mega corporations. You see, the mega corporations that are active in the software field get thousands of patents each, and they cross license with each other, which means that they form a kind of exclusive club and they avoid the bulk of the problems of the system. Meanwhile, with all their patents, they can attack almost anyone else when they want to. And as a result, software patents give the mega corporations a certain amount of dominion over all software activities. Now, <clears throat> another myth that these mega corporation lobbyists frequently cite is the idea that it's just too hard to deal with anything if the laws are different between different countries. That's like saying, uh, well, if in your country I don't need a bodyguard, that's too complex. Please make me need a bodyguard in your country the same way I need it in that country and in that country. That way I can take the same bodyguard everywhere. There's no sense in this idea. They can perfectly well deal with being free to write and distribute and use whatever programs they like. It wouldn't cause them any trouble at all. And another myth that they like to cite is the idea that if the US has software patents, that proves it must be the right thing to do. <laughs> You'll be amazed at how much mileage they get out of something so utterly absurd. Or they say, the US has software patents. If our country doesn't, have, doesn't offer software patents to, to, to our companies, then US companies will have an advantage. It's actually just the opposite. Any country that doesn't allow software patents is giving all the software developers and users in that country an advantage, which is that they don't have to be worried about being sued because of how they wrote the programs they wrote or how someone else wrote the programs they use. They're safe. They have protection from patents. You see, every country has its own patent system. They're all separate. So each country's patent office issues patents that restrict what people are allowed to do in that country only. So US patents only restrict US 
uh, companies and individuals and things that are done in the US. And Canadian patents restrict things that are done in Canada only. But everyone in the world can get a US patent. They don't have to be Americans to get US patents. Canadians can get US patents. So Canadian companies can get US software patents and then attack us poor American software developers at home. We're not safe anywhere. <laughs> but if Canada rejects software patents, then Canadians at least will be safe at home. No one in the world, whether Canadian or American or anything else, will be able to get Canadian software patents and sue poor Canadians at home. So in fact, the country that doesn't allow software patents is giving its own citizens an advantage. They could attack Americans, but Americans couldn't fight back. Now, most of the time when people describe the workings of the patent system, they are people who have a vested interest in the system. Either they're patent lawyers, or they're part of the patent bureaucracy, or they work in the patent department of a mega corporation. So they have a vested interest in making patents sound like a good system. And they do this in a particular way. The magazine The Economist once compared the patent system to a time-consuming lottery because the effects of any given patent vary tremendously. I'm sure you know what the advertisements for a lottery look like. They dwell luxuriously on the unlikely possibility that you win. And they never mention the overwhelmingly likely possibility that you lose. And in this way, they contrive to give a misleading picture without factually lying. The publicity for the patent system uses the same principle. The, the proponents of the system dwell lovingly on what it's like to apply for a patent and get one, and they tell you, they ask you to imagine that you're walking down the street with a patent in your pocket and you can pull it out and point it at people and say, give me your money. <laughs> so I'm going to try to counterbalance their bias by describing what the patent system looks like from the other end of the patent barrel what it feels like to be walking down the street knowing that at any time somebody could pull out a patent and point it at you and say, give me all your money. What it feels like to try to develop software in a country that allows software patents. A software patent, by the way, simply means a patent that restricts, that can be applied to software development and use a patent that could be used to sue people for developing software or for distributing software or for running the software. So, if you're going to write a program and you want to try to deal with the patent system and not infringe patents, what do you have to do? Well, you could try identifying all the ideas that could be seen in your program and that might be patented. But this is almost impossible for human beings. And the reason is that once you have looked at, an, at a subject in one way, it's very hard to see other ways of looking at it. And anything mathematical can be thought of in many different ways. But you'll have trouble seeing any of them except the one that you've already got in your head. So you've, you have analyzed your program in a certain conceptual structure. There may be a different conceptual structure that can be used to analyze the same code you've written or are thinking of writing, but you'll have trouble seeing the other way once you've seen one way. 
and this is important. I mean, suppose we had, suppo to make an analogy with drawings, suppose you put a square in your drawing. You could see it has a bottom edge. So if somebody had patented bottom edges, he could sue you because of, of the square in your drawing. But it's also possible to look at it diagonally and see this square as a diamond. And as a diamond, it has a bottom corner. So if somebody else has patented bottom corners, he could sue over the same, he could sue you for the same drawing by saying, I look at it this way and I see a bottom corner. And I have a monopoly on bottom corners, I'm suing you. So you, if, if you're accustomed to looking at your drawing this way and seeing it as a square, you might not notice, you might have to struggle to try to notice that it could also be seen as a diamond with a bottom corner. So that approach doesn't work. You might also think, let me find out about all the patents that might restrict this program, and then I can try to deal with all of them. That's impossible. And the reason is that patent applications now being considered are kept secret by the patent office. They may issue as patents tomorrow or a year from now, and there's no way you can find out. You can't check. So there might be nothing that tells you a certain thing is forbidden, or is going to be forbidden. You'll write it into a program, you'll release the program, people will start using it, and then you find out it's forbidden. Now this is not just theoretical, I've seen it happen. In 1984, the Compress program was written, a program for data compression. A lot of people started using it. In 1984, oh, and the author used a compression algorithm that he got from a journal. This is back when we thought the purpose of computer science journals was to teach us about techniques so that we could use them in writing software. And in 1984, there was no patent on the LZW compression algorithm. The patent issued in 1985. The patent holder cunningly didn't start threatening people right away. The company thought, let's let them dig their graves a little deeper before we go after them, and waited a few years. But by the late 90s, it was, sorry, late 80s, it was clear that Compress couldn't safely be used. We began looking for another way to compress data, and somebody wrote to me saying, I've been developing this for a year and a half, I want to offer it to your project. So we were about a week away from releasing that when I, just by chance, found out that there was another data compression patent. So I said, I better look at that. And sure enough, it covered the program we were just about to release. It was never released. Things could have been worse. We could have released it and six months later the patent might have been issued. Eventually, later on, Someone else contributed the program known as gzip, which uses a different algorithm. It's actually, it actually runs faster and gives better compression. So it seems like a happy ending. Everybody who wanted to compress a file switched to gzip. But that's only part of the ending. I'll tell you some more later, which is not so happy. <clears throat> so you can't find out about all the patents that might prohibit your program tomorrow or a year from now. But you can at least find all the issued patents because they're all published by the patent office. You could get the whole stack. In the US, that would be hundreds of thousands of different patents. And reading a patent is very hard. So you're not going to be able to study all those patents. You're going to have to try to search for the ones that are relevant to what you're doing. And that's not always easy to do. If you want to make this drawing with a square in it, you could search for patents about squares. You might not think that you should look for patents about diamonds also. There's more than one way to describe the same mathematics. And as a result, you can't reliably find all the patents that might apply to a given design. For instance, there was a patent in the US covering natural order recalculation in spreadsheets. 
This simply means that when it's time to recalculate everything, it does each cell after the cells it depends on. And that way, recalculating everything once, it gets consistent results. Now, somebody once asked me for a copy of that patent. So I looked up in our list of patent numbers, I pulled the patent out of our drawer, I copied it and mailed it to him. And a week later he said to me, I think you sent me the wrong patent, this is something about compilers. So I looked in the file again, pulled out that patent, and yet I saw it said, a method for compiling formulas into object code. So did we have the wrong patent number in our list? I started reading it and indeed that was the natural order recalculation patent but it didn't mention the term natural order recalculation. It didn't use the word spreadsheet. In fact what this patent covered was the algorithm known as topological sort. This patent has dozens of different claims and each claim describes one way of setting up that program. I'm sure he tried to find every possible variation and make another claim about each possible variation so that there would be no way anyone could implement topological sort without getting sued by him. But the uh, patent did not mention the term topological sort even though that's the term, the name that's been used for this algorithm since the 1960s. So, so anyone, if you had been working on a spreadsheet and you had tried to search for patents relevant to spreadsheets, you would not have found this one. The only way you would have known about this patent was if somebody happened to mention to you that people were getting sued and they were. <clears throat> so you can't expect searching to find you all the patents that might in fact prohibit a given program. But you'll find plenty of patents that are relevant and then you have to study them which is extremely hard. You see patents are written in a twisted kind of legal language where the words don't mean what they usually mean. It's it's hard as a non-expert to understand what the patent prohibits. Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes it's hard for anyone to understand. A couple of years ago, Kodak sued Sun, and Sun thought it was going to win the case, but Kodak won. And part of the reason is this patent is so hard to understand that nobody can tell what it covers and what it doesn't cover. It's basically guesswork. And this is not terribly unusual. The Australian government did a study of the patent system about 20 years ago, which concluded that there was no reason to believe that having a patent system provided any benefit to Australia, or Australians generally, and said that if not for international pressure, they would recommend entirely abolishing the system but instead they would recommend making patents harder to get, narrower in scope, and last a shorter period of time. Now, I'm no expert on fields other than software, and I don't really have an opinion about patents in those other fields. I will leave that to others. But I want to mention one specific thing in this report. It, cited, it, it said that according to their studies, a tiny fraction of engineers, a few percent, ever read patents. One of the supposed purposes of the patent system is to disclose how to do things. But in fact, patents provide such poor information about how to do anything and are written in such a way as to, as to make it so hard to extract that poor information that it's generally not worth the trouble. And, and everyone, engineers know this and they don't. And they quoted an engineer as saying, I can't recognize my own inventions in patentees. <laughs> I've seen this myself. Once when I was giving a speech like this, a person I spoke about was in the audience. His name was Paul Heckel. And he got a couple of patents after he developed in a program that 
was designed to make it possible to pack a lot of data, to navigate through data and show it efficiently in a small screen. There were various features for that. And the patents relate somehow to doing that. When he first saw HyperCard, it didn't look anything like his program. He didn't think it had anything to do with him. But his lawyer told him that the way the patents were written, they could be read as covering something that was done by HyperCard. So he started threatening Apple. And when that did not immediately convince Apple to hand him a large sum of money, he started threatening Apple's customers because the users also can get sued. And eventually Apple settled with him and paid him a secret amount of money. So we can't tell whether he really took them for a ride or, got, or just got a tiny amount. And this is generally the case. We can't tell what happened in most cases. <clears throat> so once when I told this story, Heckel was in the audience and he jumped up and he said, that's not true. I just didn't know the scope of my protection. And I said, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> and he sat back down and didn't utter another word. <laughs> I suppose if I had said no, he would have argued with me. But he didn't know how to argue with yes. <laughs> so that was my experience being heckled by heckle. <laughs> now, I once, because I mentioned this patent in my speeches, I tried to come up with a brief, clear description of what his patents cover. So I spent about an hour studying claim number one of one of his patents, the one that looked easier, trying to find a simple way to describe what that covers. I couldn't find one. I couldn't find anything simpler than the words of the claim itself. And those words are so complex, I could barely keep them all in my head. So if you want to understand what a given patent actually forbids you to do, you're going to have to spend a lot of time working with a patent lawyer, paying the patent lawyer too. And at the end, the patent lawyer is going to tell you, well, if you do something in this range, you're almost certain to lose if, if you're sued. And if you do something in this range, there's a pretty good chance you'll lose. And if you really want to be safe, you better stay out of this region. But keep in mind, there's a substantial element of chance in the outcome of any lawsuit. So now that you face clear, predictable rules for how you can do business, what are you actually going to do to cope with your situation? There are three options you can try. Avoid the patent, get a license, or overturn it. Avoiding the patent means don't do the idea that don't use the idea that's forbidden by the patent. This can be easy or can be hard. For instance, sometimes an algorithm is patented. Let's look at the LZW data compression algorithm. That was used in the program Compress, a program to compress a file. Well, in that case, we avoided that algorithm. We avoided the patent we found another algorithm which was better. It compressed more tightly, it ran faster. So for that one application, compressing files, we succeeded in avoiding the patent. But the same algorithm is used in PostScript. In fact, the PostScript specification says there's an operator for LZW compression and another operator for LZW uncompression. So it didn't do any good to find a better algorithm because that made different compressed files. It's incompatible. We couldn't just use the better algorithm. That wouldn't have satisfied the spec. So what were we going to do? Well, it turns out that users don't generally ask their printers to compress anything. They only ask their printers to uncompress. And it turns out that the patents on LZW, there were two of them, these patents 
only cover uncompression when the same machine can do compression. They don't cover things that can only uncompress. So we couldn't fully implement PostScript, but we could implement enough so that the users were happy. So that was a narrow escape. And then what about GIF files? GIF files are made with the same compression algorithm. Well, it didn't take long for somebody to develop another image format called PING, which stands for PING's not GIF, <laughs> which uses the gzip compression algorithm, I believe. And so we started saying to everyone, please stop using GIF, switch to PING format. And the users said, well, maybe we'll switch someday, but my browser doesn't support it. And the browser developer said, well, we'll implement it someday, but nobody's demanding it. And this shows what it's like to try to get people to switch away from a de facto standard. It's like trying to convince everyone in Canada to start speaking Hungarian. Everyone says, well, when everyone else around me switches, I'll make the effort to learn. So in 10 years of urging everyone to switch away from GIF format, we didn't have much success. You'll still find a lot more GIF files than ping files on the internet. So when a patent covers a de facto standard, it can be impossible to avoid. We used to think that JPEG was a safe alternative to GIF. And then somebody said, I just discovered I have this old patent which covers JPEG format. Now, JPEG is not a de facto standard. JPEG is an official standard issued by a standards committee. The committee has a patent lawyer, too, who says he thinks that patent doesn't really cover JPEG. I guess the court will tell us because various users of JPEG are being sued now. But these are just light cases, one or two patents covering a given algorithm. In the case of GIF, well, there were two patents covering LZW compression. And these patents both cover essentially the same thing. Now, that's not supposed to happen, issuing two patents to do two different people on the same thing. But it does happen. And the reason is it takes a lot of careful thought you have to study both patents carefully together to see that they are patenting the same thing. And patent examiners don't have time. They have 17 hours per patent on the average in the US. And that's not enough time to study this application together with every other relevant thing. So they have to cut corners. So of course they're going to make this mistake. Remember that patent that died before it was released because a patent had just been issued? Well, that turns out that algorithm was patented twice also. In one narrow subfield, I've seen this happen twice. It must happen pretty often, I guess. But those are both light cases, one or two patents covering the standard. Let's look at MPEG-2 video. I saw a list of the patents covering that. There were 39 different US patents in that list, as well as patents from other countries, which I didn't count. The negotiations to arrange for some way to license all those patents took longer than the development of the standard. Sometimes it's a feature that's patented, and then to avoid the patent means don't implement the feature. Well, that may be easy, or it may be, you know, that may be tolerable, or it may be a disaster. If it's not that important a feature, you can just leave it out, and maybe the users will still like your program. But what about after you've taken out 10 features, and then it gets to 20 features? Eventually, the users say, your program is just inferior. 
look at all these features it doesn't have. I don't want your program. The uh, <clears throat> Around 1990, the users of the word processor Xyrite received a downgrade in the mail. It turns out Xyrite had a feature where you could define abbreviations. You could say, I want these three letters to abbreviate to these five words. And every time you type those three letters followed by punctuation, they would automatically replace themselves with these five words. You could define as many abbreviations as you wanted. It was a nice feature, but somebody got a patent on it in the 1980s and started threatening the developers of Xyrite, threatening to sue them because of this feature. Well, they first tried to negotiate a license, but they decided that it was impossible to negotiate with him. He kept changing his demands. So they decided to take the feature out instead, and they sent all the users a downgrade. <clears throat> but they also wrote to me because they'd heard that Emacs had a similar feature starting in the 1970s. And I, I worked with them to some extent, and recently I found out that in fact that patent had been overturned, partly on the strength of my work. Well, it's nice to know I've had at least one patentable idea in my life. <laughs> and it's nice to know that that patent is no more, but it's one patent down hundreds of thousands to go. And sometimes a patent is so broad that it's impossible to avoid. For instance, the entire field of public key encryption was covered by a very broad patent and was essentially off limits to everyone in the US for, for more than a decade while people were actually trying to do it. And sometimes there's so many patents in a certain area, they're called patent thickets. And it might be possible to avoid one of them, but by avoiding one, you run into another. And there's no way around them. So that's the option of avoiding the patent. What about getting a license for the patent? Well, the patent holder doesn't have to offer you a license. The patent holder can just say, shut down, give up. I won't let you make such a program. Once I got mail from somebody asking for help, his business was making casino games. It was a family business. And of course, they used computers. He had been threatened by a patent holder who said to him, I demand you shut your business. He sent me the patent. It was rather interesting. Claim 1 described a network with more than one computer on it, where each computer could play various different games and was capable of, showing more than one, of playing more than one game session in parallel. That's it. Now, I'm sure that there were universities that in the 1980s set up a computer lab with workstations which had some kind of windowing facilities and were capable of showing more than one game session at a time and had multiple games on them. And these universities staff probably didn't think they were inventing anything by installing more than one game on these computers. But the patent office judge this to be an invention. And this is not, I think, because the examiner was stupid. It's because the examiner was following rules. And this is what the rules do. You see, <clears throat> according to the pat, the patent system thinks that if somebody else designs something that could do a thing once, and somebody else designs something that can do it n times, that that's an invention. The patent office thinks that if others have made designs for how to do 
A and B, and somebody designs how to do something that can do either A or B, that that's an invention. For us, those are a while statement or an if statement. But according to the patent office, this is an invention. <clears throat> anyway, ridiculous as that patent appears to any programmer, there was no way we could help him out, and he had to shut his business. But most patent holders will offer a license, however it may cost a lot of money. The natural order recalculation patent was being licensed for 5% of the gross sales of a spreadsheet. Well, maybe you could afford to pay for one such license, but suppose there were 20 different patents that you had to license that way, then you'd be rather in trouble. And then when patent holder number 21 showed up, you'd be in even worse trouble. But I'm just joking. My friends who were in business told me that, practically speaking, two or three such contracts would be enough to make your business fail. You'd never get even close to 20. So <clears throat> getting licenses for patents can be problematical, even though, it's per uh, even though the option be available. But there are some software developers for whom it's usually easy to get a patent license. Those are the mega corporations, because they have thousands of patents each. IBM has 40,000 US patents. I don't know what fraction of them are software patents, but I'd expect it's probably at least 4,000. What they do is they pressure everyone relevant into cross-licensing with them. And this way, they gain access to the patents of others. IBM published an article in Think Magazine, issue number 5, 1990, about how IBM used its portfolio, which then was only 9,000 patents. It said that it got two kinds of benefits. One was collecting money, and the other was gaining access to the patents of others. And it said that the second benefit was an order of magnitude greater, in other words, 10 times the size of the first benefit. In other words, the benefit IBM got by avoiding trouble from others' patents was 10 times the value of the money IBM collected itself from its own patents. So the, res the, the benefit of avoiding trouble is a measure of the size of the trouble you avoided. So what IBM is telling us here is, on the average, the trouble that others' patents would have caused for it is 10 times the value of the money it collects from patent licensing. Now, this is interesting because the patent system is a kind of time-consuming lottery. Whatever ha what happens to any individual player varies randomly. But IBM is so big, it can measure the average for us. And, and IBM's measurement is that on the average, the trouble is going to be 10 times the gain. But, that, but that's not really true for IBM, because IBM uses cross-licensing to avoid the trouble. It only gets the gain. But the, but the ratio is relevant to telling us what's going to happen to everyone else, those who don't have thousands of patents and can't force everyone to cross-license. They really will be getting trouble much bigger than the gain they can expect. So it's like the lottery. On the average, you're going to lose unless you're a mega corporation because the mega corporations get only the gain. Now, this is crucial to understanding why the myth of, the, of protecting the small inventor is false. You see, according to this scenario, we have a genius who's been working in his attic for years to develop a better way of doing something. And uh, now it's working. So he's going to turn this idea into a program. 
and then he wants going to want to uh, or some kind of product this this scenario was used for all fields so he's going to turn his idea into a product and he's going to make it and he's going to sell this and get rich except for one thing the big companies will immediately compete with him and they'll take all the market away from him he'll be left with nothing and his company will fail and he'll starve now this is a series of unlikely assumptions first of all mostly progress in high-tech fields is made by people who are working in the field and in communication with others not by people in isolation in their attics second if he's a genius, that doesn't mean he knows how to run a company. Probably he doesn't, because most people don't. So probably his company is going to fail. In fact, in the U.S., not, over 90% of new companies fail within five years. I don't know what the figures are like for Canada, but I guess it's more or less similar. So probably his company is going to fail anyway. But let's assume he also knows how to run a company. Well, then it might succeed. Not all new companies fail. If he's good at this, maybe he'll succeed. But one of the things he'll know if he's good at running companies is that since this is a small company, he should try to take advantage of the strengths of small companies and look for specialized kinds of markets where it doesn't pay for the big companies to compete with him. If he does things like this, his company might be a success. It may not make him tremendously rich, but it could be a success. On the other hand, let's assume that despite knowing how to run companies well, it still fails. Well, and supposing it fails so mainly because of the competition of the big companies. Well, if he's so much of a genius and so skilled at running companies, he doesn't have to starve. He could surely get a job. So this scenario is a series of unlikelihoods, but let's look at it anyway to be charitable. The scenario con continues by saying that the patent system changes everything because our genius can get a patent. And then when IBM tries to compete with him, he says, IBM, you can't compete with me. I've got this patent. I'm protected. And IBM says, not again. <laughs> That's the myth. Here's what really happens. IBM says, oh, you've got a patent. How nice. But look, let's look at the program you developed. Now I'm specializing it mainly to the software field. Because in software, a program is a, combines a lot of ideas. And IBM has patents on some of them. So IBM says, let's look at the program you wrote. In addition to having your brilliant idea, it has lots of other ideas, and we have this patent, this patent, this patent, this patent, this patent, each of which prohibits some other idea that's in your program. So, and if you think you can fight all those, we'll pull out some more. So let's sign a cross-license agreement, and nobody will get hurt. So our genius knows, because of his skill in running companies, his understanding of business, that he has no choice. He signs, IBM shakes his hand and says, and goes away and competes with him, just the same as if there were no patent system. That's what it means. IBM gets access to the patents of others. It means that even though our genius got a patent, it doesn't do him any good when dealing with IBM. it might protect him from you and me, meaning it might enable him to stomp on you and me, but it doesn't enable him to avoid competition from IBM. Now, IBM can't force all patent holders to cross-license. There are some exceptions. And these are the patent holders that don't make anything except threats and lawsuits the companies that don't produce any products or services. Their sole business is to squeeze money out of others using patents. Patent parasite companies, I call them. IBM can't threaten them with patents because there are no patents that restrict them. The patent lawyers tell us that it's wonderful to deal with the patent system, 
but they have avoided having to deal with it themselves. There are no patents on how to send or word a threatening letter. <laughs> there are no patents on how to file a lawsuit. There are no patents on how to persuade a judge or a jury. So it's impossible for anyone to get a patent covering what those parasites are doing. Even IBM can't make them cross-license. But IBM figures, we'll have to pay these parasites, but our competitors will have to pay the parasites too. It's just part of the cost of doing business, we'll survive. And they recognize in IBM that having software patents gives them power over other real software developers. So even though IBM usually can easily get a patent license, there are exceptions when they can't. Meanwhile, there are some software developers that find it especially hard to get a patent license. And here I mean those who develop free software. And the reason is that the usual terms of a license require a payment per copy. Now, one of the things about free software is nobody is in a position to count the copies. If I were offered a patent license requiring me to pay one millionth of a dollar per copy, the total amount of money I have to pay might be in my possession right now. But I can't count how much. So I can't fulfill that contract. I can't, I can't tell how many copies there are, so I don't know how much I have to pay. And no one knows how much I have to pay. Of course, a patent holder could, could, could choose arbitrarily the terms for the license. The, pat, the patent holder could offer us a license for a, a fixed one-time lump sum payment. And then, at least theoretically, we could do it. But usually they want something like $100,000. The reason free software has been able to do so much is that we can develop software without money. But we can't pay lots of money without money. So that's the reason why I'm concerned about software patents. I'm part of a large software development effort, and I want to be able to develop a lot of software and not be sued and forbidden. This is basically the same reason every other software developer except the mega corporations want, is against software patents, because they want to be able to continue developing software and not get sued and threatened. So though, that's the second met way of dealing with a patent, get a license. The third way is to overturn it, prove it's invalid. To do that, you have to show what's called prior art, which means provable instances of publishing the same method before the patent application. In other words, the dice were rolled years ago and if they came up favorably for you, and you can find evidence now to prove it, then you have an argument to take to court to invalidate the patent. If you don't have an argument, it's a waste of time. You'll have to lose. If you have a good argument, then you might win. But it'll cost you a lot of money to get there. A few years ago, Qualcomm was a defendant in a software patent lawsuit and lost, and had to pay $13 million, of which $8 million went to pay the lawyers on both sides. The system is unfair. If the patent holder loses, the patent holder does not have to pay the lawyers of the intended victim. But if the victim loses, the victim has to pay the lawyers of the patent holder. It's not symmetrical. At least that's the way it is in the US. I'm not sure it's, that's the same in Canada. But in any case, it costs a lot of money, which means that if you are threatened, even with an absurd patent that is likely to be invalid, that's, that's, that, pa that absurd patent is a very dangerous weapon 
if you don't have enough money to actually go to court and prevail over it. I'll take questions at the end. I don't want to break the flow. So that option exists, but it's not a very useful and palatable option. So for each patent that restricts, the, that, that, that comes near what you're trying to do, you have these three options. But each one is possible or impossible, feasible or infeasible, depending on different factors, which means nothing guarantees that at least one of them will work. Sometimes, when you get bad luck, none of them will work. And when that happens, your project is dead. However, we don't, software developers don't actually go and look for all these patents. And the reason is that the penalties for patent infringement are much worse if you knew about the patent. <laughs> so what we are advised to do is keep our eyes closed and just start making our design decisions and hope that we don't step on a patent. <laughs> you know, and with each design decision, probably nothing bad happens. It's a lot like crossing a minefield in this respect. With each step, probably nothing happens to you. But you have to take a lot of steps. There are a lot of design decisions in making a large program. So your chances of getting all the way through safely are negligible. But this analogy is not perfect. Once somebody has stepped on a landmine, it's not dangerous anymore. <laughs> so people used to ask me after my speeches about this, other fields of engineering have been dealing with patents for decades. Why should software be an exception? Look, of course, at the bias in that question. There's, that question is worded so as to imply that we presume there should be patents unless there's some powerful reason against it. That's like saying other people got cancer, why shouldn't you? <laughs> However, if we take away that bias, we can get a thoughtful, good question, which is what differences are there between fields that have an effect on what is good policy with regard to patents in various fields? That's an unbiased question, which raises the same issue and makes it possible for me to answer it. There's an important difference between different fields of engineering, and that is how many different patents are likely to prohibit any one product? How, how many patents apply to a, to a typical product at once? And that varies between fields. We have all been exposed to the myth of one product per patent. The idea that someone who designs a new product will get the patent covering his whole product's design and that it's impossible for anyone else to already have a patent on this new product so he doesn't have to worry that his new design is already forbidden by existing patents. That's the myth. And that wasn't always a myth. In the early 1800s, it often worked that way because products were much simpler then. But today, no field actually works that way. However, they, some are closer than others. The field of pharmaceuticals used to work that way until uh, a few years ago, maybe a couple of decades, I don't know. But it used to be that the patents covered a specific entire chemical, the whole structure of one chemical, which means that if someone developed a new pharmaceutical, it was not patented already and whoever had developed it would get the one and only patent covering that precise chemical and nothing else. And they still do have these patents covering entire chemicals, but nowadays, so, so if, this is, if, this is, if this is the 
the paradigm that once was true but now is a myth, pharmaceuticals was, was really working that way until some years ago. Now it's moved some distance away, but not too far. And the reason is we only barely understand why drugs do what they do. Nobody's in a position to combine 50 different ideas in one drug. It's, that would be too hard. We don't understand them well, the human body, well enough to do such a complicated thing in that field. So people only managed to combine a few ideas. So there would only be a few patents covering one drug. And so the pharmaceutical field is no longer fits this paradigm, but it hasn't moved too far away. Other fields of physical engineering have moved farther away. People can combine easily dozens of ideas in mechanical structures or, or electrical circuits, maybe more. But the field that has really gone far away from this paradigm, that false paradigm in the patent system, is software. Software packages can combine thousands of ideas. Why is software over here on the extreme? There's a systematic reason for this. It's because in software, we are, combined, we are making designs out of idealized mathematical components that have definitions. In every other field, people are trying to build physical things out of physical matter, and they have to cope with the perversity of matter, which doesn't have a definition. There are theories that try to model what it will do, and sometimes your theory's right, sometimes your theory's wrong. And when your theory's wrong, tough on you. You're not allowed to say, there's a bug in this plastic. <laughs> there's a bug in this steel. No. It is what it is, and if that isn't what you wanted, tough on you. And that makes it hard. You know, these, these annoying problems you couldn't have foreseen just plague you, and it's hard to make something really work right. In software, by comparison, because we're only dealing with mathematics, the parts at least always do what they're supposed to do. We can build a castle and support it on a mathematically thin line, and it'll stay up. We couldn't do that with physical substances. When I'm developing a program, if I put an if statement inside of a while statement, I don't have to worry that as this while statement repeats, the if statement will shake and vibrate at a resonant frequency and crack. <laughs> I don't have to worry that it will vibrate even faster and induce radio frequency interference in other parts of the program and the values will be wrong. I don't have to worry about how much heat the if statement will generate and whether that can escape through the while statement or so that the if statement won't burn out. I don't have to worry about whether some kind of corrosive fluid from the environment might get in between the if statement and the while statement and eat away at the contacts between them until maybe the if, if statement breaks or, or the signals don't pass and the values are wrong or the voltage drop gets higher and the if statement doesn't function anymore. There are just so many things I don't have to worry about. And not only that, I don't have to worry about how, supposing the if statement does break or burn out or corrode, I'm going to pull it out and put in a replacement if statement. And I don't have to worry about how each time I build a copy of this program, I'm going to manage to insert the if statement inside the while statement. How will I get access to it? What order do I have to put these parts together in? When designing physical products, they have to be designed for manufacturability. You have to design the, the factory to make the product. And sometimes you have to design the product so as to simplify the factory. And then you've got to build the factory, which is a very big investment, often. But when I want to make copies of my program, 
I don't have to design a factory, a new factory, to copy this program. I can just type CP or DD. Or, you know, there are these general purpose copying things that'll copy any file. Whatever program I've just written, I can copy it the same way. So there's a tremendous, amount, tremendous number of problems that I don't have to worry about and very large burdens of design that I don't have to do. And this makes designing software much, much easier than the fields of physical engineering. That's easier for the same size of complexity of the design, same number of design elements in a program and a physical thing, it's going to be much, much harder to get that physical thing to work. But we can suppose that the intelligence range of people in all these fields is the same. So what do you do? You have people with the same intelligence, but you give them an easier kind of job. What are they going to do? They're going to push to the limit. They make the jobs bigger, and eventually it gets to be hard. So that's what happened. The software systems that we can design are much more complex. I'm not saying harder, because they're, they're, they get to be equally hard. It's the limit of human intelligence that's limiting in both cases. But the number, the size of design it takes to reach that level of hardness in software is much bigger than to reach the same level of hardness in a physical field, where there are all these problems to cope with. So we can make things, systems that are so much bigger, that do so many more things. A physical system with a million different parts in its design is a gigantic project. A program with a million parts in its design has a few hundred thousand lines. That's nothing. A few people will write that in a few years. And what this means is that programmers can put mo implement more different ideas every day than people in any of those other fields. We can make programs with thousands of different ideas in them, and we do it all the time. And what this means is that the effect of the patent system changes. It becomes a kind of gridlock where the ideas are almost irrelevant. The work of our field is combining thousands of ideas and making an interesting program that's useful and doing the details right so that it works well. That's the big job of the software field, making these very large programs, each of which does many, many things. A system in, to promote having and publishing ideas at the cost of obstructing the use of these ideas by combining them in large combinations makes no sense at all for our field. In the other fields, I'm no expert. I don't have an opinion. I'll leave those fields to the experts on those fields. But what's clear is that there's a big reason in our field why patents don't make sense, a reason based on the difference between software and the fields of physical engineering. If you want to see how many ideas there can be in a program, just look at your word processor. It has hundreds of features. Each of those features is at least one idea. Some of those features embody several different ideas at once. So there are thousands of ideas there. If any one of them could be patented, it's hard to be safe developing a word processor or using that word processor. But nowadays, we don't have only speculation to draw on, because one study has been done of one large program, namely Linux, the kernel of the GNU plus Linux operating system. A lawyer in the US did a study of Linux, and he found 283 different US software patents, each of which covered some computation done somewhere within the code of Linux. I read that Linux is approximately one quarter of one percent of the entire system. 
which means by a multiplication we can estimate around 100,000 software patents prohibiting something done somewhere in the system. Of course, this is just a rough estimate. It wouldn't surprise me if it were as little as 20,000 or as much as uh, 300,000. But in any case, even this rough estimate is enough to show you what the problem is. <clears throat> so even if we were to consider the question of software patents in narrowly economic terms, how does it affect progress and development of software? We have to see that it's a negative effect. But even if we, add, but let's forget about how it affects software. Let's just ask how does it affect progress in software ideas? Let's ignore all the harm it does to software development. Even if we just look at its effect on ideas, surely it means more ideas, right? That's not necessarily so. You see, a lot of the ideas come from people developing software. You're writing a program, say it's a word processor. Well, you've seen lots of ideas for how to make word processors work, so you pick your own combination of them, but as you're working on it, you'll have some new ideas. And whenever you have a new idea, you'll think, oh, if, if, you th if you think about it a while and you think, yes, this is really better, you'll implement it that way. So your word processor will have some new ideas in it, too. You didn't do a research project. You just had an idea while you were writing the program, and you used it. So we get ideas this way. If we throw obstacles in the path of software development, we're also as a, going to lose some of the ideas we get as a byproduct of software development. So we can, this system can even backfire in terms of its own narrow lim stated purpose, which is to increase the number of ideas that are known to the public. But suppose we ignore those ideas that come as a byproduct of software development. Surely the patent system would result in more spending in research. Not necessarily. In the site www.researchoninnovation.org, that's research on innovation but without punctuation, slash patents.pdf, you can find a mathematical model showing how in fields where there is incremental innovation, a patent system can actually discourage spending on research. So even if we look, uh, ignore all the unintended harm that the system does, it's still likely to backfire. There's a lot of incremental progress in the software field. So if we were to judge the question of software patents purely in economic terms, how does this affect the amount of software that gets developed and how much progress is made in it, we have to conclude that the system totally backfires, its, its effects are negative. But it would be wrong to judge the issue of software patents this way, because software patents directly restrict every computer user. And in wealthy countries, the computer users are on the order of around half of the citizens. They also include, so, so, so this means soft, having software patents is a direct denial of freedom to a large fraction of society. This is not merely an economic issue. It has economic effects, negative economic effects as I've, as I've explained, but it's but that's just a side issue compared to the issue of directly restricting a large fraction of society. It also ties up a large fraction of businesses, all the ones that use computers, in a new form of bureaucracy. Now, I am not one of those who is against all government regulation. I think a lot of government regulation is justified. But it better, but there needs to be a strong social reason to have regulations. And we have to recognize that imposing a new bureaucratic system on all businesses that use computers 
is not a particularly good thing. It would require a strong justification, and there is no justification. And this, I'm not talking now about software companies or companies in the IT field. I'm talking about a large fraction of all businesses because they don't develop software. They may not understand programming at all, but they use computers. And the users can get sued too. If you look at the site ffii.org, you can find a poster called Your Web Shop is Patented. This poster shows a screenshot of a browser looking at a, an imaginary website, an e-commerce website. And this site shows various features you're likely to find in e-commerce sites and labels them with the patent numbers of the patents that the European Patent Office has issued on these basic features of e-commerce starting with a website for selling objects <laughs> and accepting payment by credit card. Now these are not just things we could imagine might be patented, these are things that had patents issued for them. Any country that authorizes software patents can expect these same patents to be brought there. They will mostly belong to mega corporations and very few of them will belong to Canadians. <clears throat> theoretically, yeah, it's, theoretically, any of them could. A few surely do, but the number that do is small. <clears throat> so you're talking about a policy that is harmful to almost everyone involved in computer use. I'm sad to say that the Canadian government recently had a commission very quietly rewrite the interpretation of patent law so as to authorize software patents. Your government is shafting you and is trying to do it hushed up. They didn't have a public consultation that anyone noticed. They invited people from the mega corporations and people who promote, quote, intellectual property, unquote, to consult privately. And the result was 180 degree shift in policy imitate the US. There are too many people around the world who want to imitate the US. It's a very bad idea. Remember that the US government is run by f religious fanatics who do not believe in any form of civil liberties, who practice torture, and launch wars of aggression on other countries. So imitating the US is not a wise approach towards policy in any country in the world. <clears throat> it will be up to you now to organize, to expose what's going on here, to criticize the government for having even tried to change the policy uh, in a hush-hush way and demand that this issue receive public debate and do careful consideration. So at this point, before I ask for questions, there was a plan to say something else briefly and then it will be questions time. Uh, to get to show prior art on a patent, do you have to show like uh, the prior art being a subset of the previous or of the new idea? Or? Basically, the patent is a long list of claims, and each claim stands or falls on its own. And each claim has a list of points in it, and any anything that has all those points is prohibited. And any 
any previous publication that has all those points wipes out that claim. So if this claim has five points and your program has these five points in it, your program is prohibited. And meanwhile, if you find an article which shows all those five points, this claim is gone. Now maybe this claim has the same five points plus two more, and if those two more are not in your program, this claim would not attack you. And if the article didn't have those two points, it, might, it probably wouldn't attack this claim. Uh, the distinction with physical versus the virtual is the software. Um, if someone patents a screw and there's a lot of variety of skills there, it's a physical screw, not a concept. I don't understand. A physical object is not a concept, but I don't... A screw manufacturer patents a specific screw of physical dimension. No one has a law on the concept. The, you mean the general concept of, quote, a screw, unquote. Uh, those would be two different things. A patent might conceivably cover a screw of the following dimensions, which were which is useful for some specific purpose for some specific reason. Or you could imagine a much broader patent that would cover all screws. For instance, in Australia, a couple of years ago, a patent was issued covering the wheel. <laughs> Not wheels of a particular kind, shape, uh, you know, size, substance, but the wheel. Now, one hopes that that patent would not be enforceable on the other hand, if somebody had a lot of money and he wanted to enforce that against you and you didn't have enough money to, to stand up to him, you might get in trouble before the judge got to the point of saying that patent was ridiculous. I, I heard that a friend told me that the U.S. Patent Office is patent. Yes, it's a patent for, swinging, for a method of swinging sideways on a, on a swing, which is a matter of pulling on the, the, the two ropes, I think. A, ch a child, the child of a patent lawyer, filed that application and I believe wrote the application with help from the father. <laughs> Not only that, but someone I know got a patent on Kirchhoff's current law, <laughs> which is that says it's, if there are a bunch of wires that are connected together, the sum of the currents coming out of all those wires is zero because whatever comes in th through certain wires has to go out through other wires. Uh, he got a patent on that in the 1960s, and he did this so, so as to demonstrate the, to himself that his suspicion that the patent office was, a, was stupid uh, was correct. <laughs> <clears throat> and he said that once he got this patent, he certainly never intended to try to enforce it against anyone, he kept it under his bed, and every so often he would pull it out and laugh. <laughs> now, Kirch Kirchhoff's current law had been known at the time for 130 years. And this is relevant because people used to keep saying, oh, the patent office is doing foolish things, issuing foolish patents, because it hasn't come to understand software yet. Just give it some more time. But this shows that 130 years is not enough time. Would you comment on the feasibility, your thoughts of the feasibility of the open source? I can't source? hear you at all. I'm sorry. Would you comment on the feasibility of the open source community developing its own sheaf of patents in order to cross license with mega corporations? Well, I'm, I'm not involved with open source. I never have been. The same question would apply to the GNU organization. Uh, it's not feasible. It costs a lot of money. And the other thing is, it takes a specific kind of cast of mind to notice that you could try to patent something, right? I've had at least one patentable idea in my life, but it didn't occur to me that it was a patentable idea. Another problem is we get a lot of the people who contribute to our software work for software companies. Maybe they're developing programs for various 
clients to use in-house or whatever, but they probably, and, and their employers will let them contribute to our projects, but their employment contracts say that any patentable ideas they think of have to be given to the employer. So they can't contribute patents to us in that way. So it's just not feasible for us to, tr to get enough patents that we could try to use them to defend ourselves. And, and as I pointed out, even IBM can't defend itself in this way against the parasites, and neither could we. Hi, thanks for your presentation. And I would I, like... I, you have to speak slower and paying more attention to your consonants. I would so like I to thank you for your presentation. Uh, as a disclaimer, I would like to say that I'm neither a lawyer nor a computer scientist. I'm a biologist and we have a whole set of problems with pharmaceuticals and patents. But I think at the core of this issue of intellectual property protection... Uh, yeah, please, there is no such issue. Okay. I already explained, it's a mistake to even speak of a, quote, issue of intellectual property, unquote, or to call it protection you've already become confused. Anyone who speaks of, quote, intellectual property, unquote, is either confused himself or trying to confuse you. In your case, I'm sure it's that you are confused, but not malicious. <laughs> but so in, in the case of patents, um, the issue with patents is how this whole system started is try to protect the person that had the idea tried to protect his... Well, he, the, it's, when it started, remember, the product's designs were simpler, and a patent would cover an entire product design. Absolutely. So but my, question, my question then is to you, if you, you're proposing not to have these patents, not to protect the ideas or the work, uh, whichever I, I, way it I, is... To, to speak of, quote, protect the idea, unquote, is propaganda. Ideas are not hurt by being known to more people. They're not damaged in this way. But that phrase tries to make us think so. So please don't use that propaganda phrase. As to whether it makes sense to have patents on physical design method, physical techniques, physical design parts, uh, I don't know. As I said, I'm not an expert in the, I don't do those fields of physical engineering. And However, there is one field in which, there are two fields where I think that there are other specific problems that, and one of them is pharmaceuticals. Uh, there certainly shouldn't be pharmaceutical patents in poor countries because that's murder, that's mass murder. Millions of people are being killed by the enforcement of pharmaceutical patents in poor countries. That should be unconscionable. Anyone who tries to enforce those patents should be charged with murder. And anyone who pressures for the enforcement of those patents, such as the Bush regime is doing now, should be, anyone involved with that should be tried for murder. Hmm. Whether to have such patents in wealthy countries is a somewhat different question. Uh, most drugs are not so expensive that people in the U.S. or Canada are dying in large numbers because they can't get drugs. Some people in the U.S. are. That's true. Uh, but it's not most people. However, the, the question is whether it really promotes useful medical research. Now, it turns out that most of the medical research done by the pharmaceutical companies is not going to save anybody's life. It's to develop another alternative drug to get a share of a big market for problems that are not life-threatening but annoying to people in wealthy countries and lots of people are going to buy that drug. Well, I won't say this is worthless. It is useful to have more different drugs that solve these problems, but it's not so tremendously important as they want us to think. The drugs that actually save someone's life tend to come out of government-funded research, not privately-funded research. So if, if I may rephrase my yes. question then in order to get to it, um, 
The, uh, if you propose, if your idea, and bear with me for a second, is that uh, protecting, quote, protecting, end of quote, ideas, it's not the way to go, and I totally agree with that. Um, well, I'm talking about, so I've been talking mostly about the software field alone. Right, right. Yeah. So is, is it, would you propose then that the use of those ideas or the art generated by any idea, protected or not protected, should be all free? So I, the, the, I don't know what word to use. The, the position I am arguing for is that there should be no patents or any restrictions on incorporating ideas into software that you develop or that you run. That there should be no patents restricting software development or the use of that software. And why not to extend that to say the, the fruit of any ideas generated well, should be all free? Well, i the fields are different. I, I spent a long time explaining how the number of different ideas we combine in one program is a lot more than the number of ideas combined into physical products. And the other thing is that patents on physical products only restrict a comparatively small number of specialized companies. So that really is just an economic matter. It's not directly a matter of the freedom of a large fraction of the citizens. So I'm content to allow in those fields the decision to be made as an, on an economic basis. And I'm not an expert in those fields. So I don't want to have an opinion about those fields. Maybe it would be com good to completely abolish the patent system, or maybe not. I don't know, and it's very hard to tell what the effects of the patent system are. But I would rather simply not take a position on, on patents in most of physical engineering. Life-saving drugs are a special case. We can take a position against patents on life-saving drugs in poor countries without having to take a general position on patents on physical engineering of all kinds. I would rather not take such a sweeping position, take, take any such sweeping position, because I don't have to. I can leave that to people who know those fields more than I do. So if, if your position is to abolish patents completely, I'm not arguing against you but I don't want to advocate something that broad. In my last comment, sorry to the other people, is that why stop at patents? Why not abolish software copyrights? It's a totally different issue. It's a mistake. You know, when you, just to ask the question that way asserts that patents and copyrights are similar. Nope. Well, they're, well why would you assume that if you're starting to do anything with patents would naturally take you next to copyrights. Why copyrights? Why not chairs? Why not? Well, the point is that to, you have assumed that they're similar. You're, you're not recognizing this, but the way you asked that question was saying, in effect, patents and copyrights are similar. If we do something with patents, let's think of doing the same thing with copyrights. And uh, they're not similar. They're totally unrelated. If I plant a tree, why not plant a bird? I and mean, it's, if trees and birds were really similar, that would be a logical thing to ask. I don't think that's a crowbar. It looks like it's a, a handle from something. Oh, I see. Yes, it is. It's a table leg. Can we ask people to use the mics, please? We are taping this. Well, if, if we're going to use the mics, it makes sense for people to just line up at the mics. You know, make a line. And then it'll be obvious always who's next. 
Good evening, Richard. Thank you for uh, sharing your evening with us. Something occurred to me whilst you were speaking. Let us say that someone like myself using a program, let's call it Nightmare Notter, for, for lack of a better word, that develops web pages. We're actually using a form of compiler when we do our graphical design, what we do is converted into code. Now, even if Nightmare Notter itself has, by some divine miracle, managed to escape any and all software patent traps, is it not possible that what it produces will step into a software patent trap? I don't know. It's I, conceivable. It, it certainly is, isn't it? it? And there, once again, the user, the end user, is the one who's walking right into that trap without any prior warning at all. That's quite, that is at least theoretically possible. Whether, whether there really are patents of that kind, I don't know. But there could be. I suppose it depends on what is patented. For instance, if someone had managed to patent the concept of a loop, then that would be pervasive in, in everything. Yeah, well, fortunately, even in the U.S., there were no software patents until 1980. And, uh, you know, they might still, you know, they could issue a patent on loops. Uh, it would be like the Australian patent on the wheel, in, in the sense yes. that uh, it wouldn't really stand up in court, but they might be able to use it to intimidate people who don't have the money to fight them in court. Mm. So if I may be forgiven the sin, patenting a loop could be considered a form of circular reasoning? I don't know. Anyway. Very justified. Thank you, people. Um, second question, and I will make it quick. I don't want to block the line for too long. The difference between physical manufacturing and software development, and this is actually a comment. How many of us in here, may I have a show of hands, can afford to buy a computer? Good enough. How many of us can afford to buy an automobile factory? <laughs> an issue of scale. Yeah. Massive issue of scale. Thank you once again, and have a good evening. There's a point I forgot to make, which is, I think, worth making, an analogy that helps explain to non-programmers what software patents do. It's an analogy between programs and other large works of writing, such as novels or symphonies. This is a good analogy because a program, like a novel, or you know, a program contains lots of instructions. A, a novel contains lots of words. A symphony contains lots of notes. And in each case, they implement ideas. In a novel, there are literary ideas being implemented by the sentences. In a symphony, there are musical ideas implemented by the notes. But you can't just take an idea and plug it into a novel. You have to write words to, to implement it. Likewise, you might have a musical idea, but you can't just plug it in without change into a symphony. You have to implement it. And implement, there are many ways to implement one idea, and how you would do it if you were writing something good would depend on what the rest of the, of the work was. What other ideas were in that work would influence the way you'd implement each one of them. So. Imagine that in the 1700s, the governments of Europe had had the plan to promote the progress of symphonic music with a system of musical idea patents, so that they would have issued patents for any kind of musical idea describable in words. For instance, you could have described, or someone could have described a, a four-note motif and got a patent on using that series of four notes as a motif. 
and someone could have got a patent on a series, a sequence of chords, and someone could have got a patent on a formal structure of repetitions for a movement, or someone could have got a patent on a rhythmic pattern, or on using certain instruments together for a while while the other instruments are silent. Uh, or, you know, for any given combination of instruments, there could have been a patent on, on using those instruments together. Uh, so now imagine it's 1800 and you're Beethoven and you want to write a symphony, but there are thousands of musical idea patents you're going to find it's harder to write a symphony you don't get sued for than to write a symphony that sounds good. Now, being Beethoven, you would have complained about this. You would have said, this is a ridiculous system. But the patent holders would have said, oh, Beethoven, you're just jealous because we had these ideas before you. Why don't you go invent your own ideas to write music with? Of course, that would have been an absurd thing to say. First of all, suggesting that Beethoven couldn't have new ideas. And second, suggesting that he should have written music using nothing but his new ideas. One of the reasons we consider Beethoven a great composer is because of his new ideas. In fact, some of his music was quite controversial because of the shocking things it did. It's, they're not shocking to us now. Now, we're used to them. But when first heard, they were shocking. They were new ideas. But people were able to get used to those new ideas because they were combined together with lots of recognizable ideas to make a piece that w went just a, a certain amount beyond the envelope of what people could accept. And thus, they could stretch to learn to accept it. Beethoven combined each new idea with a lot of ideas that were not new, and thus he made recognizable music. Nobody, not even a Beethoven, is such a genius that he can reinvent music from zero and make something that people will recognize and want to listen to. Pierre Boulez said he was going to reinvent music from zero, and he tried, but not that many people listen. And nobody is such a genius that he can reinvent programming from zero and make useful software that people are going to want to use without using the ideas that are around and without using things that are de facto standards like the diatonic scale, <coughs> like uh, LZW data compression, uh, various things that, that everyone expects to find in certain kinds of software. Having such musical idea patents would not protect composers. It would threaten composers. And all composers, just about, would be against them once they saw what it was doing. I see how late it is. I'd like to answer three more questions and then call a halt. Uh, I just had a question about uh, your opinion on the lawsuit between SCO and IBM. I know it's occurred a, a while ago. Well, um, that, that, that lawsuit has nothing much to do with patents and probably not much to do with anything. Yeah, well, I know um, it Even just, if your code was... They probably don't have a case because they've, all, they've acted cagey like, well, we'll show some evidence someday, 
and it looks like they have none. Yeah. But even if they won, that would not be a disaster. A software patents are a far more important issue. I, yeah, I just want your opinion. I didn't get any yeah, of your I, opinions on the internet, that's all. Okay, well, next question. Hi, sorry, my question's a little bit long, but I, I hope you'll find it a little bit entertaining. Um, you, you've given us some, some, uh, some unhappy stories, okay, and, and I'm, I'm wondering, is this really so surprising? I mean, isn't it just the nature of the beast that legal issues are by nature thorny? No, this isn't thorny. There just shouldn't be software patents. <laughs> the reason, the, the pressure from, for software co patents comes from the mega corporations. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So, so uh, the, the, certainly, uh, legal issues can have a lot of negative ramifications. I want to think about the old paradigm. Uh, 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 and is this a pipe dream? Is it a pipe dream that that the legal system and laws should be based upon philosophical principles? Um, I'm thinking of. It, it, it's the legal system, the, the, the system of lawyers and judges and the, and the, and the, and the courts, well, the is justice based, system, based upon philosophical principles. Yes, it I'm, is. Is it something... But in which philosophical principles? Right now, the philosophical principle is what mega corporations want can't be wrong. Okay. That's so, the philosophy okay. Okay. that current laws are being okay. based on. So I'm, I'm thinking of the legal system as being very lofty and very pristine. I'm thinking of like well, an image of these... Well, it never was that, but there was a, a more... In some ways, we used to be able to see a certain kind of integrity, which to a large extent is missing now. Okay. Okay, so I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of this image of these, these, these Oxford dons on their dais serene. I'm thinking of this... And, and now it seems that... Lawyers have to listen to people like you because you've got something to say, right? So how is the skill set that politicians and lawyers and judges need to have, how is that changing in the world today? Well, the, you've asked several different questions. Uh, I'd like to contrast the way the Indian patent law of the 1970s was, uh, was developed with the way the Indian patent amendments of the 2000s have been developed. Although this isn't India, that presents a very clear example. In the 60s, the Indian government convened the, the wisest experts. These are the 1960s? Yeah. Okay. Well, it couldn't have been the 1860s. There was no, and at that point, India was part of the British Empire. But in the 1960s, India was for a while independent. and convened the wisest experts to try to draw up a patent law that would be good for Indians, okay. that would promote progress of a kind that would benefit Indians. And for instance, they decided not to allow patenting drugs, but they did allow patenting methods to produce drugs. And the reason was they thought Plenty of research in finding new drugs was going on in other countries, but not much research was going on in how to produce drugs more cheaply. But Indians, a lot of them being poor, India needed to make drugs cheaper. So they designed the patent law so it would do that, and it worked. In fact, there were inventions made and patented in India for how to produce drugs more cheaply. So that's and the 1960s. That was just, they, they thought about it in the 1960s. They adopted it in the early, I think, 73 or so. Nowadays, India has a patent law that's mostly decided by the requirements of the World Trade Organization. And close, in, in December of last year, the government issued a decree changing patent law. Uh, this, there had been discussions which had not reached a, a conclusion. And one of the things that, you know, they, they had, they had all, a few years ago already, they changed that wise decision about patenting drugs. But I believe in this decree, they extended the powers of patent holders on pharmaceuticals and on plants 
And also they opened the door to all kinds of software patents. And they did it dishonestly, and that's quite common. You will often find dishonesty in moves to authorize software patents. For instance, you will find frequently that, uh, <clears throat> that they will say that a certain law will not authorize software patents, but careful sh study shows that it will. And the Indian law said it would authorize patents covering a combination of hardware and software. This is in the, as a result of the World Trade Organization. No, no. This, no. The, the World Trade Organization doesn't require software patents of any kind. But the, but the Indian decree said, it would, said that it authorized patents of combinations of hardware and software. Well, what does that actually mean? We were asked to think it meant specialized embedded systems doing some physical job with software to control it. But I knew this was not true because I've read a lot of patents, US patents these were, which described a physical system containing, well, it described a system and it just said it includes a processing unit, a memory unit, an instruction sequencing unit, and means to carry out this computational step and this computational step and this computational step and this computational step. Well, what does this mean? This is describing the computer with a program on it, right? The first three things are part of the computer and the rest are part of the program, but it's described as a combination of hardware and software. The description of the hardware is general enough that any computer fits it. So what it really amounts to is a patent that enables them to sue anybody who runs that software to do those particular things on any kind of computer. So really, it's a software patent, but it's written in the form of a patent on a combination of hardware and software. So I realized that that Indian decree was, for all practical purposes, blanket authorization of software patents. Well, it turns out the Indian parliament rejected the decree. And this isn't just a, um, a metaphor you're using. You, no, th this, this is Indian not a metaphor. Software on, this, these Indian patents on pharmaceutical uh, methods of production would actually have implications on software development? No, no, no. Those were two separate issues about India's patent law. Okay. There, there it wasn't a metaphor or an equation. These are two different issues, both treated by India's patent okay. law. But, what I, what I, but the reason I brought this up was to respond to your question about how laws should be thought about. Mm -hmm. Look at the change from the 60s and 70s where they had the wisest people they could get think about what patent law would be good for Indians to 2004 where the government all of a sudden issued a decree which was not based on any kind of consultation with wise people, it was just a response to lobbying where they hadn't even bothered to listen to those people that they were su supposed to talk with. Thank you. And then look at the Canadian government today rewriting patent law, to patent interpretation, patent, the, the specific guidelines that they used to interpret the, the law, because they haven't changed the law. You know, there was no vote about this. But, but they re rewrote the interpretation of the law and did it quietly. The last thing they wanted was to have a consultation with people who would try to look at what was best for the country. Because their philosophical view of the mission of government is to give megacorporations what they want. So you think they need to find the grassroots of those arts? They, they should look at the grassroots, but basically, democracy is too weak. Democracy means that the people rule and determine the laws. And what we have, when businesses, when, if, a, if a business owner has more influence than one of you, that means democracy is being distorted. Democracy is more or less sick. Well, now the mega corporations have tremendous influence, so democracy is very sick. Uh, 
Um, my question is uh, basically, in, in a large respect, you're preaching to the converted here. I think a lot of us here would agree that patents are having a damaging effect. Um, as a society, though, we seem to be going a different way. My question is, well, how it's long not do society. It's a small number of people working for the government who are going a different way. But, but what in a uses sense, it though, to it's talk also to society. you? Well, I hope that now you will do something. It's not just thinking something in your own minds isn't going to change anything. But Agreed. working might. Yeah. So my question is, is, from a realistic perspective, one, how long do you think we're going to be stuck with software patents before... I, don't, I can't predict the future. Okay. And it depends on you. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know that much about how the Canadian government and political system work. I know a little bit. Okay. But I, I couldn't be the one, I'm the wrong one to ask about how to take political action effectively mm -hmm. in Canada. You know more about that than I do. Okay. From a historical perspective, even in the U.S., typically major changes have been preceded by severe pain, if you will. So what do you see as being in the future perhaps the biggest um, catalyst for eliminating software patents? Could it be the Well, in the U.S. Parasites? or in Canada? Well, say in the U.S., because typically in the U.S., in the US this is where the we The only way I can envision it happening in the, the U.S. The U.S. democracy is so sick that we have a president who's stolen the election twice in a row, and uh, the newspapers hardly talk about it. There's now proof that he was lying constantly uh, in the months leading up to his invasion of Iraq, uh, lying about the claim that he had not order, already decided to do so, when he said he had not already decided to do this. Mm -hmm. this, was, this is now proved by documents, and the media are not talking about it. Democracy in the U.S. is so sick that it's just a menace to all of its neighbors. The only way I can envision the U.S. doing anything so intelligent as to eliminate software patents is if the rest of the world is enjoying an advantage by not having software patents and eventually it looks like it's too much of a problem for the U.S. to subject its software developers and users to these problems. Yeah, that's what I thought as well. Thank you, sir.